Joining me on the podcast today is elite marathon runner, coach, and content creator, Philly Bowden. Philly is joining us fresh off her most recent marathon in Berlin, which catapulted her presence in the sport, running an impressive time of 2.25 and a PB. Philly's not your typical athlete with an unconventional journey to get to where she is today. Her openness and honesty is what has drawn so many people to be invested in her journey. You can't help but want her to succeed and achieve her ultimate dream of performing at the highest stage, the Olympics. Running has changed her life and the person she wants to be. From a disruptive childhood, it has given her purpose and enabled her to channel her energy into something positive. Like many others, Philly has faced personal challenges, including battling an eating disorder at a young age. In a high pressure career, the question arises, how can she maintain her well-being and prevent facing such a difficult struggle again? In this conversation, she shares how. Guys, I'm incredibly proud to say that my first book, Fortune Favors the Brave, published by Penguin, is now in stores to purchase, or you can order your copy online. The book consists of 76 short lessons on finding strength and vulnerability. Adversity is something you will inevitably face in life. I wrote this book to share and showcase how to process that and what can come from it. Adversity is something we wish would never happen to us, but it does. I want you to understand though that it can inspire you to achieve incredible things, not just for yourself, but for others too. Everyone on this earth is born amazing at something. It is just a case of finding out what that is. Life is incredibly short and valuable, so make it count. You may find that you don't believe in your ability or fearful to test yourself. By the end of this book, I believe you will. To get yourself a copy now, it can be purchased at Waterstones, Amazon, or by simply clicking the link on my Instagram bio, Joshua Patterson underscore JP now. Billy, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. It's great oh, to be here. I'm so excited to have you on. I just, I think you're, although we've never met in person, I, um, I find you really refreshing in this space. And I think, you know, you're not just a good runner, but I think it's actually your personality for me is what really stands out. Do you get that quite a lot? I do. And I find it really weird because <laughs> I'm you? like, I'm just me, you know? But do you, do you not think in this sport that that that's a massive asset because I find there are so many athletes out there who are incredibly talented and I don't know whether it's media training or being a slight introvert but I just I think the way you are on camera how you articulate yourself and your energy I think that's why people warm to you. I look at kind of what was out there when I was growing up as an athlete and I suppose like social media has changed and everything um but I think I still see a lot of the kind of like there's a shield be between like athletes or people in those positions and then like the people that are fans or get to watch them on tv if they're like the, you know the top athletes and you don't actually know the people so I think that's what's cool about being able to do like youtube and social media today you can just kind of actually show people like who you are maybe that's the kind of like connection I think that's that's definitely the difference in this sport now right as in like if you look at athletes of old, you're right. I mean, the only time really you would kind of get to know them is maybe like a few microseconds of an interview post race, mm. right? Whereas you never really got an insight into their lives, kind of behind the scenes, all their training. Whereas now, I don't think there's ever been any more sort of like investment into a person's day to day. And I think the asset you probably have is, is that you've kind of gone or started this sport without social media but kind of been young enough of age to kind of get into social media to understand mm. the formula and how to work it. Yeah. Because I think people still are wrapping their heads around it. I mean, I, I was very much the same, like pre-social media. You know, social media has been in the game now for what, 10 years and I'm still trying to understand yeah. how it works because the formula is ever changing. What maybe worked five years ago on Instagram doesn't necessarily work now. Yeah, I think that's what's cool is you don't really know where it's going to go. And although you can obviously like educate yourself on the algorithm and try and create something that's going to get some momentum but also it could change without you knowing and you could be all of a sudden doing the right thing or you can just sort of like park that side of it and just be directed by like what's exciting and that normally resonates with people that I feel like that's what we've been doing and it definitely feels like the most kind of fulfilling way to do it anyway because you're then genuinely just doing you know what you're 
energy wants to do, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, 100%. And I think what's, what's unique about you is that, you know, you're not the conventional professional athlete. And I think what's exciting about that is that that gives people so much hope and belief in themselves that you don't necessarily have to go down that conventional route, whatever that even means these days, in all honesty, like, it almost felt like to be a professional runner, for instance, you know, you were kind of plucked from a young age, you'd be representing GB, you'd be within that system, you'd probably be on the screens relatively early competing on the highest stage. Yeah, and that was very much it. Whereas now, individuals are kind of becoming professional athletes in their mid to, to late 20s. Yeah. You know, and it could what started out maybe as just a bit of a passion has now become that professional career. There's a lot of stories, of people that I know anyway, that have kind of come to the sport later and maybe not everyone knows about that because it's not necessarily been kind of shared or talked about as much. But I think, yeah, there are so many ways you can do it. And if you're one of those kids that isn't, you know naturally winning races by 100 meters like doesn't mean that you can't work really hard and then like in five years time be being the person that was winning those races you know it's sometimes i find it hard to get a true understanding of someone purely just from instagram i guess the luxury with you is is your youtube channel and people can really see like a raw side to you and i think and i'm not just saying this because i'm sat opposite you but i find sometimes with youtube you can kind of see when something's slightly manufactured mm. and i feel like with you what you see is what you get. Like, I, I do think that's a true version of you. And I think it's it's really nice to see your honesty all the way from sort of like your childhood, pre maybe social media, and gaining that profile, because I think yeah. that's how people can kind of connect with you more. I think that's it. Like, I mean, I make all of these videos with my boyfriend as well. We've always started it and like continued it together. So whenever we're sort of brainstorming ideas or working on a video where there maybe is a little bit more planning or sort of like packaging on the back end it's always done together and we sort of yeah come back to that it starts with what I'm actually doing or what I've done and then like ends up being a video at the end of it so it, it is yeah it's just kind of brutally honest I think a lot of the time which I don't know you can try and maybe do something similar to what someone else is doing or be inspired by what they're doing but as long as you kind of bring it back to putting your stamp on it and you know being genuine. I think people appreciate that. You probably might say different, but I think in terms of maybe recognition, you know, far more people may be knowing who you are now than prior, say, Berlin. Mm. For those of you who don't know, Philly basically had just run the Berlin Marathon and you PB'd. It was your fastest ever time, right? Mm -hmm. You ran it in two hours, 25 minutes, yep. which is, it's sensational. Like the pace of that is unbelievable. But I think for me, the major focus here is that sometimes people just home in on that. It's Philly just done Berlin Marathon 225. But actually, it's your story and how you got to that point, I think, is, is so big. I always hate that question when someone asks me my why, because I have to like kind of go away and I like really kind of study that to get to the answer. I thought about it the other day. And I think it's like continually asking, but why, whenever you've answered it sort of thing, because I'm sitting there saying, well, I want to get faster. But why? to see what I can do, but why? And is it to sort of prove myself wrong? Because those kind of invisible limits get broken. And that's really exciting. I think that feeling is like so addictive, but also boiling it down to being super simple. It's just really fun. Like both the process and then doing the thing is really fun. So it seems really basic, but like that's enough, you know? Yeah, but, I mean, do you know what you, you say that though, but I think actually if you look at how vocal you are about your childhood and how dis disruptive you felt you were mm. and actually having the awareness of that you know running changed your life in that sense where when you talk about a why that was probably it it was mm. probably to become a better version of yourself you 100%. were a good person you were a great child but mm. maybe just found yourself in a situation where you maybe had a lack of understanding or a lack of inspiration and I think sometimes when you don't necessarily have that purpose or focus that kind of gives you the space to be the disruptive person, right? Because you're just kind of filling the time. Yeah. But I think when you have something in your life that has true meaning to you, mm. you don't want to taint that. Yeah, I think it's so instrumental as well in like kind of carrying you and directing you, even when you feel a little bit lost or when it's not perhaps going your way, being able to kind of come back to that and having a strong enough feeling that it still is the right thing to do or, you know, 
kind of the cliche of it lights your soul on fire. On the tough days, you're like, okay, well, get this done and I'll get there rather than kind of just throwing the towel in on it. And I don't think when I was sort of searching for something to do when running wasn't going well enough for it to be my career or my life, I was trying to find that in, you know, an office (laughs) and like white walls and this kind of, like you say, no inspiration. I found that really difficult. Um, So, yeah, I feel very thankful to be in the position I am now. You discovered running. Was that something that was kind of introduced to you by parents through a friend or was that just something you stumbled across? Because, you know, for me as a parent, there are so many questions around you and your childhood because actually like by discovering running really changed everything. Mm. And there are so many children and even adults out there right now that are finding themselves just in limbo and lost Mm. and aren't always going to have the luxury of somebody being able to introduce them to something. But equally, if you don't know what it is that you love, how do you really discover it? Because sometimes the idea of trying to discover that can be so daunting because there are endless options. Yeah, I think it was a slow burn. I I was always attracted to anything kind of extracurricular, like outside of the classroom. So I was playing guitar, doing karate, playing basketball. Um, I was a sea scout. And then I would go from scouts to running when I joined the running club. Um, and I enjoyed it, enjoyed the the culture, the kind of social side of it. And then gradually got better and got more and more into it. And I think my parents kind of figured out then that was the thing. Like I would go to all of these other clubs or practices but when I kind of expressed that this one is the most important I'm going to maybe cut out some of those now and please don't ever let me miss training I really want to go um that was that was kind of it what what is a sea scout (laughs) it's It's so funny as well because we're (laughs) nowhere near the sea it's just going to scouts but uh, the group that I was part of was sea scouts so we had little sailors hat and like little neck and chiefs. Can we get a photo of that? Is, is there somewhere we can go into <laughs> the can, archive and I find this? I can find this? one, yeah. Wow. We, we never did anything at sea. It was all just the same stuff that scouts do, like getting muddy and like letting off steam, basically. Unbelievable. Let's see, I, I never would have known that. I've ne- I didn't even know that existed. And I love the fact that it has absolutely nothing to do yeah. with the ocean and yet you wear a sailor's <laughs> We should hat. have definitely done something, you know, like related to going to sea, but we didn't. That's amazing. <laughs> and I mean, as for like your parents, you were saying they kind of, There was an understanding there, I guess, just seeing your passion within running. Mm. As a parent, I think there are going to be parents who are listening to this podcast. How how do you find the balance, I guess, with your child where you discover they have this passion for something? And it's like, how do you, I guess, motivate them or how do you support them through that? I think I was very lucky that neither of my parents were particularly pushy with anything I did it was always kind of directed by me if they could see that it made me happy and that was the goal I wanted to achieve they would then sort of support me with that if I turned around to them today and said I don't want to run anymore I found something else I want to do they'd be like great happy for you sort of thing um my dad was a runner so he would kind of take more of an interest and still today kind of just gets it a lot more when I tell him sort of like paces or he'll understand why I'm doing a particular race in the lead up to another one whereas my mum will come to a race and ask you know do we need to bring wellies to this one and I'll be like no mum today's a track race not cross country sort of thing but I think that's really really nice that she's just happy for me and like amazed at whatever I do and then if I want to kind of like get a little bit more of that kind of like in-depth kind of you know a little bit of healthy pressure then I can talk to my dad about that. You've just said something there that's kind of triggered me in a little bit in the sense that you know my daughter loves dancing and music. Mm. It dancing is definitely not something I've ever really necessarily invested in. But say, for instance, she gets into ballet. Yeah. It might be worth me actually doing some research into that. So that if she does come to me, I have maybe a bit more of an understanding mm. of her passions, which then hopefully can kind of like, yeah. I don't know, spur her on to, to further that dream. With running, I only came into the sport a number of years ago. Very, very recent. But obviously I have a better understanding of that. And that's kind of maybe the direction I've steered her in, not necessarily because I want her to compete or take on the things that I have, but I think it's more just, and you'll get this, understanding the impact that running can have on your life. Mm. Like for every challenge I've ever done, it's it's not necessarily the success of the challenge, but the ripple effect it's created within my relationships, my friendships, my career. Mm. You know, whenever, even my mental health, whenever my mind tells me I can't do something, I can reflect on everything that I've accomplished and know that that's utter nonsense it's just a voice inside my head yeah and although she's only seven years old now you know recently I got her to do her first 5k 
Ooh. which, you know, she resented it in truth. <laughs> she really did. And she keeps saying to me, like, don't make me do that again. But yeah. I know when she's older, when I'll go, you ran your first 5K when you were seven years old. I know yeah. actually that'll put a big smile on her face. And again, for me, it was a case of with reflection. It's like when she tells herself she can't do something, you ran a 5K, bub. Like, yeah. you have more than enough potential yeah um but i guess it's just finding that balance where you know again i just i'd never would want to be too pushy it's easy to kind of project where you find that feeling or like the same for me it would i i i try and recommend running to anyone that you know wants to take something up or even if they want to get fit or even lose a little bit of weight because you will fall in love with it and be doing it for other reasons once you get past the this is shit phase like when you're unfit and it's just going to be horrible for two months once you get past that it's amazing but I think other people can find that in so many different things. Like it might be something sport related, but if you're super passionate about something that involves, you know, creating something or a product at the end of it, it's hard if you can't relate to it because it's not the thing that gives you that feeling. But I think it is the same. Well, if someone was to try relate to you, I guess, because we, you know, with your childhood, what, what do you think it was that, I guess, provoked that sort of behavior within school? Was that just a lack of, identity or understanding I think I probably was sort of hiding myself behind being the clown and like entertaining people I definitely got a hit out of it like I got a buzz out of pissing the teachers off and the rest of the class laughing about it and I could get away with it to an extent because I did well academically I could have done better if I actually like did some work and tried but I think it was knowing that I'd be all right and seeing it as well it's more fun this way anyway um I have an older sibling who is like complete opposite six a stars six a's at GCSE and I think there's a little bit now that I look back of the comparison being well I'm not going to be that good so I might as well just have a laugh and be pretty average and kind of focus on yeah my social circle more than kind of yeah the classroom I don't think I saw it as important enough do you know what though that that the compa- you know that that line of comparison is a thief of joy what you've just said there so many people relate to and mm-hmm. actually so many people can now benefit from that i think in terms of improving the direction maybe in which they go in yeah when you look at how you compared yourself with your sister i guess in terms of her accomplishments you've already written yourself off without even really trying totally saying that i'm not going to be that person mm-hmm. when in reality your journeys were never really going to go yeah. down the same route And I think there are going to be so many people out there that have probably gone down that route too, where they've compared themselves to someone. And it's so unfortunate because actually they're gifted in their own way. Mm. But I guess it's just a case of maybe finding that out. And equally, I guess, with parents and the influence maybe they can have in in terms of reading that language maybe quite early on. Mm. The person that I would love to know about, though, if you've managed to connect with them, is Rowena Couch. I haven't. And it really upsets me. <laughs> I saw some old school friends this weekend at the wedding I was at. And I I really want to be able to, you know, just send her an email or find out where she is and, and genuinely say, you know, like, really sorry for being a little shit. Because um, she probably was younger than I am now when she was teaching us, having left university, like, fresh into school. And, you know, Poor woman didn't deserve what she got from me. <laughs> I'm, I'm hoping with this podcast, hopefully it's just another platform where yeah. we can use this audience to try to do research. Just to give context, Rowena Couch was Philly's German teacher. And, you know, there's this really beautiful moment, I think, within Philly's videos, where, or one of her videos, where you know she's expressing kind of like how, how her childhood panned out and, you know, how she felt she was disruptive in school. And there's this particular German teacher where she felt like a lot of her energy was really sort of like invested in her we'll say and um it's just this opportunity to just sort of rectify and just to let her know sort of where she's at right now and she's sorry and actually that would have been a beautiful moment but that moment has not happened yet no the power of social media needs to come through it will happen this week's episode is sponsored by runner runner is a personalized running coaching app helping runners of all abilities train for any goal from a first 5K to a marathon, even an ultra marathon. When the time is right for you, your plan can be created within a minute and ready to go. With each plan, Runner provides all the help a runner requires, including strength and conditioning, and you can also reach out to the team at any time via the support tab inside the app. For a two-week free trial on any personalized running plan, 
Use the code PHOENIX. No matter your goal, Runner is there to help you achieve it. But I think with you, within your journey, you kind of running, I think it was distinctive when you kind of signed up to your first run club at, or run, yeah, it was your first run club at 14 years of age, right? Mm-hmm. And I guess things then in a positive way just kind of progressed from that point. Yeah. How early on did you realize, I guess, from that, did, were you like, do you know what, running, I think is really going to be the sole focus here? Or was it more just a case of this is a real passion and then it just developing? I would never have been confident to sort of say, I'm going to be really good at this. I'm going to run for Great Britain one day. You know, I'm going to achieve some of those things, which back then I would have thought would be like end goal, a goal, that's it. Um, but in practice, I was, you know, willing to work away to be the best I could could be, which, you know, eventually gets you to those things. Um, I think I took a year out before I went to uni and improved a lot in that time because I could focus a lot more on training. I was just working for a year out. Um, and I think at some point, it's not like a specific moment or memory that I can pinpoint, but I think there was a gradual feeling throughout that time. You know, I got invited to my first British Championships, raced Eilish McColgan in that race. I think she won by quite a way and I was, you know, near the back, but it's the first time I had my name on my number. And it was the trials for the Olympics that year. You know, there were some really, you know, legit people there. And just to be part of it and to see that, like, I was on that kind of, moving up on that spectrum of kind of ability and kind of performance, I guess, was probably, yeah, like a big turning point, I think, in kind of believing that it will be something I can make a life out of. When you look at kind of like the time you're running at right now with the marathon, is is there a goal in mind of where you think you can physically take it? Or do you think there is a limitation? I don't think there's a sort of time in mind that I think is either the limit or the be all and end all because like the sport's always going to move on. People are always going to run faster. The technology is always going to improve. People can take that away from you. So I think it's kind of more focusing on the performances themselves in terms of, you know, I would love to get to the Olympics and then, and then what, you know, how high can I finish at the Olympics and what kind of memories can I have to look back on when I can't run fast anymore? Cause I think, that's something really important to think about rather than kind of getting your getting caught up in a time or a performance being the be all and end all otherwise you might look back and kind of regret just thinking about that and not appreciating kind of what you got to along the way because in terms of the performances and the races themselves it makes up a very small proportion of what you actually spend your time doing and I mean especially for a marathon like it's going to be a couple a year maybe so that's what five hours worth of running and obviously the whole performance around the day and the kind of atmosphere around that feeds into it too but spending hours a week and a month kind of training for it and enjoying the process like that's probably going to be a bigger portion of the memories when you look back on it so like making those really important as well and appreciating that you get to do it yeah and I mean it's such a unique sport right in the sense that most of the people that you're going to be training with on a daily basis are equally the people that you're going to be competing against. Mm. So you guys realistically know everything about one another. If you sustained an injury or a slight niggle, they can work to that. I guess that's the advantage, right? Yeah. Have you found the environments you've kind of exposed yourself to have really helped that? Because one of the biggest moves you made is when you went up to Manchester. So mm. when you signed with New Balance, you kind of, you, you joined in with their crew up there. Yeah. Did that make a difference? Because I think... You know, I, I'm, I'm one of those individuals where I'm based in London right now. And, you know, the training element can be so difficult when you're only doing it on your own. Mm. When you can run with other people, it makes such a difference to the day overall. Yeah. And actually looking forward to those runs, especially I think when you go into those like autumn, winter months. Yeah, yeah, it's huge. I And I'm looking ahead now at the next couple of months, doing a lot of that on my own now that I'm not part of that team and I am kind of based on my own, but also when I go out to Flagstaff, I have my teammates and I have training partners out there. Um, and you kind of piece together a little bit of company here and there. But no, that move was was big. I mean, for me, just in my career, but also in terms of a change of mindset, you know, joining these people that are already professional athletes, doing it kind of as their job, uh, me lumping it together with, you know, whatever work I'm doing um, and having that company. Um, even though they're not my teammates at New Balance weren't marathon runners. They were kind of track runners and shorter distances, but we would do our easy runs together. 
And even if we just did the warm up and then started different sessions, we're in the same place. There's still a feeling of kind of a collective, which I certainly benefit a lot from. Some people, you know, love the solitude of training on their own. But in the marathon, you make the most of the company you can get, because even when you do get to sessions, if you've got people around you, you might be doing it slightly differently because there's so many different ways to get to the same time and different people kind of need to train differently for you know what they need to focus on um so yeah you kind of make the most of that company when it's there for sure do you think you've got a a true understanding now of kind of the environment that you you need in particular because i guess it it really is tailored like you Mm. said some people are more than happy just running every week on their own some really i guess will prosper from having that physical connection with other people yeah totally i mean for me it's huge it's such a big reason why i enjoy the training and enjoy the sport is meeting up with other people meeting other people because running's this weird sort of bubble where everyone knows everyone and you get introduced to other people and then you kind of make friends through training and races and whatnot um i love that side of it and i think it's it's interesting looking back how some environments i was in sort of told me or or try to put it as this is the way it's done and this is the way you should want to do it, but actually realising you can do it any way that you want to and if that social side of it is important, great. And you can mess around and have a laugh. I kind of found that about the trail element where I'm based in London and the reality is the only kind of trail I guess we have in terms of some elevation would probably be like a Richmond Park, Mm. which just isn't really going to cut it. And so when you're looking at the competitors, I've just found that when I've kind of gone to to kind of uh, enjoy certain races and you look at these high-end athletes or just runners in general that have chosen to move in a certain place, knowing that they have that at the end of their fingertips, altitude mm-hmm. training, certain elevation, different types of terrain is going to be such a benefit and mm-hmm. actually how important that really is. Yeah, You know, so many people I know in London, I mean, you have to work with what you have, but say if you have a 100K trail in France and you're just running on a simple concrete or tarmac road. Yeah. You know, you're getting the distances up, but I think you just, it's about that adaptation and it is so challenging. Do you think you found the perfect location? I mean, I know you moved up there to be with a particular team, but do you think Manchester has really catered for you and that's the place to be? Because, you know, if you are passionate about running, you know, making that move is substantial, but there's a reason why Yorkshire, for instance, is almost like the haven, right, for, mm. for most athletes. That seems to be a really popular place. And I think that's probably because where it's situated, again, you kind of have everything at the end of your fingertips. Whereas London, I, I don't think London necessarily is the best place mm. to be, in all honesty. I hate running in London. <laughs> it's, do you know what? It's, it, it, I find it so stressful. I've been running now for maybe like four years. And it's only now where I've just realised if I want to do my long runs, I will have to do them in Battersea Park. Mm. And the reason being, although it's, I wouldn't say it's tedious, I kind of, I quite like that I can switch off with Mm. the repetition of circle, but the stop start of the roads Mm -hmm. and the cars, it just doesn't make for great fluidity in all honesty when you are doing the runs. It's distracting, isn't it? And I think sometimes as well, when the, even when the pavements are busy, that can if you're in a bad mood already, that can be annoying when your running is meant to be your sort of like safe haven to like kind of let go and get into the flow of it if you're then stopping to like hurdle a child or a dog. Um, I think where we're based just outside of Manchester is probably perfect for kind of trail running and and that's not my bag at the moment at all. Um, I do like really struggle with some of the hills up there, not sort of physically, but when I want to just switch off and run on the flat. I've got to literally run uphill for a mile before we get to the canal, which then still isn't flat because we've got like 16 locks in a row where we are. Um, So I think it was the right decision to move up there, joining the team at New Balance whilst I was there. And that kind of was a real key change in moving my life to be just solely focused around running. Um, But I think I have found that perfect place now, but we're not there currently. I think we're probably going to gradually move in that direction that's heading out to Flagstaff in Arizona so my coach is based out there we've spent 10 weeks there in the summer booking another trip for two and a half months in the new year to do like altitude training out there but I can compare kind of the benefit I get from those stints up there to people that live there and I think it's just something you've got to kind of do now or never that's so exciting 
it's super exciting. It's also terrifying because like the idea of moving kind of your whole life to another continent um, is a, a big job. But I think, yeah, we've got to do it. Mm. Ultimately, when you look at the Olympics and you look at who got top spot, America, I just think in terms of athletics is just yeah. head and shoulders above everyone and anyone. I mean, mm. if you look at the college system. Yeah. It's phenomenal. It's on a completely different level. And I think that's where we, we seriously lack in this country right now, is that there are so many talented individuals out there. And then when you kind of get to university, a lot of those talents, I think, are lost. Just yeah. because the infrastructure isn't necessarily in place, unless they fully commit to a club, I guess, mm -hmm. alongside university, a lot of these universities don't necessarily offer that. You kind of have to get to the same level as these kids that are getting, you know, as much support as a professional team out in the NCAA without all of that support. And you're expected to be running the same times, making the same teams. Because, you, you know, Keely Hodgkinson is, you know, only just finished being university age. And she's obviously got a lot of support being on funding, but she's the minority. But anyone else that is trying to get to that level is doing it whilst doing their degree, but without, you know, in America, they've got so much support, like the facilities alone, just physically what they have there. But then the staff that are paid to kind of be your support team is an amazing opportunity. And it just hasn't materialized in the same way here, I think, because of how those systems have developed and that there is money in the kind of sports system in the universities over there. And it's just not the way it is over here, which is, I think, you're kind of on the back foot. There was a really substantial moment, I think, within your journey where, you know, you found yourself released from your contract with New Balance, or it was a mutual thing, if anything. And you kind of stuck in limbo, I guess, for, for a couple of months, kind of figuring it out. But I think what was really interesting is there are going to be so many individuals out there that wouldn't have even had the contract in the first place. And sometimes you realize, like, if I'm competing and I'm early doors and I'm not necessarily winning or getting prize money, how can I earn a living to, to afford this? Yeah. And that's where I think things like social media now are such a powerful tool for anyone of any age to be able to utilize. Because actually what you've learned from that, and I've learned this for myself too, is that if you're sat there waiting for these contracts to come along to pay you, you're really going to struggle mm. because they don't always come along. And it is a competitive market and it's great that it's that that's the case. I think for yourself, it was understanding things like social media was going to be a really powerful tool and your YouTube as well, where you can kind of take it into your own hands. And I think the good thing about anyone at school level or university is, you know, you are so busy with your studies, but equally... Having that gives, I guess, it's, it's a lot of flexibility, right, in order to yeah. be able to document those things. And even when you are struggling and stressed, those are really important things to document too, because mm. that's what people relate to. Yeah. Yeah, it's a different way of doing it. And I don't, I don't think it's for everyone at all. There are some people that, you know, would cringe at the idea of even like filming themselves talking about their training, you know, let alone putting it out there for people. Um, and that's actually the advice I give people that want to start but are scared about what people are going to think or worried about that is just film a video and don't put it out there. You don't, you know, practice and you don't have to show anyone. But reality is no one really cares. And if they do, they think about it for about five minutes and they move on with their life. So just don't care what they think sort of thing. Um, and it's funny because I think my boyfriend Daniel saw it as a way to kind of support what I'm doing and saw it as you know, it can potentially grow into something that means that you can do this without a contract and you take it into your own hands and say, this is the way I'm going to do it. You guys can support me or not, but I can support myself. So I don't care. I don't think I actually believed when we first started doing it, that it would get to that point. You know, he's always been really big into YouTube and understands that like you grow an audience, you, you can earn some money from that. And I thought, nah, no, I'm not going to happen. Like no one's going to watch this sort of thing. Um, and it's really cool now to be in that position where yeah, a contract is really great to have. And I'm like very privileged to be supported by a brand with On. Um, but I also don't need that. So if the, if the results don't come through for a while or I get injured, you know, I'm still going to be able to support myself and obviously have to make some like creative side steps and document, you know, an injury, you know, when that happens, because they do come up. But it feels not only more secure because it's a little bit more in my control, but a more fun way to do it because I'm getting all of this like other stuff out of my running 
by creating along the way and I'll be able to look back on it one day which is really cool as well. How do you find you get your fulfillment in this sport because I guess sometimes it's so much easier to kind of home in on the things that haven't gone well for you rather than really appreciating the things that have and actually you know like you said you you can you can kind of look back and go look how far I've caught I've come I mean there are so many things to be so incredibly proud of but naturally the more competitive you are the higher you set the bar of what you want to achieve the more challenges inevitably that you are going to be faced with um I work with a sports psychologist which has been so so helpful the last couple of years um just to kind of schedule that time in to talk about how things are going and also to delve a little bit deeper behind like oh the session was crap and now that's how I rate myself as an athlete and actually saying well firstly that's not helpful so let's just like discard that let's go another step further to say like what was helpful from that workout that didn't go the way you wanted it to or that race and kind of owning that and taking it with you because I've had races that haven't gone well but I don't think I'd change them looking back because first you're always learning in, in the mental aspect and the physical aspect, like what you need as an athlete. And then that race or that session is a little pin, if you like, along the journey of like what's next and you take that with you. So I think having those sports psychology sessions has kind of brought me on board with that kind of way of thinking, which is so, so helpful. And I take that with me into, yeah, those conversations with Daniel when we're talking about goals or what's next. And I try to use it to sort of ground myself in those moments where I am feeling negative because you're not constantly positive or constantly kind of thinking you're doing great. You have those moments of doubt. But I think, yeah, reminding yourself, for example, in the Berlin block, you know, great result at the end of it. Had sessions that were a real miss and moments where I'm there thinking, I don't know if this is going to happen or am I even going to get there or this part of my body's hurting? Why is it failing me? And then, you know, next block when I have that moment, that tough time, that session, just remembering that like in the end it was okay. And if it wasn't, what was good from it? Like, what did I take forward? There's always something. You know, the reality is, is people have kind of been inspired by what you're doing and they'll be running five, sometimes six times a week. Mm. They won't just do a single marathon in a year now. Some of them will be signing up to 12 to 15 different races, Mm. different distances. If you look at the level of investment you've had to put into yourself in terms of like a sports psychologist, physio, Mm. sort of soft tissue therapy, strength and conditioning coach. When does it get to a point with sort of the average individual where they have to start considering that level of investment too? Because you know, ultimately, if they're going to expose themselves to to kind of the harshness of that training, mm. and I guess being as competitive they are by signing up to that, a lot of that probably will have to come into play at some point in order to get longevity, because I guess the level of impact on them physically will eventually take its toll. I think everyone's different in terms of what they need. You know, there are some people that will, you know, would rather invest in working with a nutritionist. You know, if it comes to a choice, sports psychologist, nutritionist, I feel like I'm pretty good in that department. or less room to grow or it's just not as important to me I'm going to focus here um I think it's about taking the parts that you see someone else is doing and that would work for you that is helping them and taking those on board but also not seeing it as something you have to replicate there could be you know adding yoga in for someone might be the best thing like mentally and physically giving them that sort of space to be mindful but also like recovery you know relaxing um I'd love to say I'm someone that does that but like it's gonna be the first thing to go in my week you know relaxing for me is probably better spent watching something on the sofa for an hour and putting my phone away so that I'm only focusing on one thing and that's actually genuinely recovering um but it I think it's difficult because that question of there's always more there's always something else I can do like kind of throwing the kitchen sink at it um but it's it's a balancing act for sure do you, do you think that with continuity, do you think Berlin will change your life? It feels like a life-changing moment. I think I already am seeing the differences it's making, kind of communicating with race directors for what's next and where that puts me in terms of the support I get from them. You know, just having a different number next to my name, like it, it's a big deal. And kind of having that ranking now as well, like looking at the fact I'm ninth all time in the UK, it's pretty sick looking at the names I'm surrounded by. Am I looking at wanting to be fourth or fifth or, you know, as close to Paula as I can get? Absolutely. But it's um, it's nice to sort of appreciate it in the moment as well, rather than immediately thinking about 
what's next and that bar being raised and anything below it being like not good enough because otherwise you can kind of get bogged down I think. How do you describe the feeling when you cross that finish line? Crossing the finish line was more relief than kind of you know euphoria and like the fun of it all. My favorite part of the race was the last 10k because I was just surprising myself and comparing to my previous marathon that was the opposite, you know, huge positive split and hanging on for dear life and really having to coach myself through toughing it out and finishing that race. I was kind of expecting that or that kind of level of toughness to be faced. And you're kind of asking yourself, when's it going to get really hard? When am I going to slow down? When am I going to hate this? And when that wasn't happening, it was like I was sort of being let go and being able to just enjoy it. And the crowds are building and I'm picking up the pace and you just kind of feel invincible. And that lasted for, you know, a good half an hour, which was more fun than the moment of like actually crossing the line. But I think because you're constantly thinking, well, I can't carry on at this forever. You know, if the race wasn't 42K and it was a little bit longer, once you get to the finish line, you're sort of like, oh my God, (laughs) I've actually like kind of sealed that now. And it wasn't, oh, it was great until this. When you look at the atmosphere of that particular location, does that have a substantial impact on you? Because I guess when you are, the intensity levels of what you're subjecting yourself to are so harsh. Most athletes will probably admit that they completely switch off and won't really take on what's going on outside. So maybe Mm -hmm. that makes no difference. For somebody like yourself, we've discussed this, like you are super interactive. Mm -hmm. Like you're very aware of what's going on. Yeah. Does that, does that, do you really feed off then the location that you're at? Do you think that's why Berlin equally maybe had such a profound impact on you? Because that is, I've done it. It's one of the greatest marathons in Mm -hmm. the world. Yeah, a hundred percent. I think I've discovered that like through working with my sports, like that it's a huge benefit for me. I think a lot of people like to block it out and not be distracted. Um, and I've done that at races before and really regretted it where I've sort of looked at the atmosphere and felt like I didn't let it in enough because it does help me. That definitely wasn't there in the marathon in January in Houston. It was so quiet. And I think it's difficult to say for sure because I'll, one day I'll have a tough day at a race that does have a good atmosphere. I think it will help me, but I think it is slightly different when you're feeling amazing and the atmosphere is amazing. And it's just this kind of like circle. It's like building and building. Um, but no, it's huge. Like I think just giving like a, a smile back and a cheer back, they then see that and like, oh my God, she's 35k in, like she's cheering back at us. So they cheer louder and it's kind of, it just builds to this like um, unreal feeling. So you know, I really want this to be the defining moment where I, I just can't get out of my head. You being, what was it again? The coat, was it the, the sea, sea scout? Yeah. <laughs> You know how like Mo Farah has got like the Mobot? <laughs> I'm sure you have like a cult following right now. And I really, it, was there like a hand signal or anything that you had in the scouts that we can get your fan base to start adopting when they see you? I, I was going to go with that, but that you don't, you don't fly we, in a We boat. do like a salute, like <laughs> are we just, all out. Are we just going to, honestly, if anybody's listening to this, please, 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 <laughs> next time you see Philly at race, if you can just give her... <laughs> That scout, honestly. I feel that... like Tom Evans owns that as like the army guy oh, that's on the that? running scene. Yeah, he kind of salutes at the end. But I've I've got my slogan, so that I'll have to do for now. What is what is your slogan? It's love the grind. Mm. Yeah. Do you enjoy it? You I do? think. I mean, that's what it's about. Like loving it when you're meant to hate it. You know, like in the process when you're grinding through. I, I would love to to hear your side of things with this. You know, you speak really openly in one of your videos on YouTube about your past, if you don't mind talking about it, with with eating disorders. Mm -hmm. With myself, with my mental health, like running has been the greatest gift for me in the sense that it's really helped me battle my issues with my mental health. Yeah. But equally, when I get the balance wrong, it then starts to have the impact. Mm -hmm. With yourself, I guess, in the level you're competing at, it's getting bigger and it's getting bigger and it's getting bigger. How do you find that balance, I guess, with your past? Because I guess it's, it's something that you're never over, but it's something that you live to sort of cope with, right? Yeah. Do you find that as, I guess, the performances start to increase, there becomes more pressure on you? Or do you think you found yourself in a position now where you've tailored it to, to be able to face it in a much better way? Yeah, I think it's interesting, the point about pressure. I think I always put the most pressure on myself. Externally, it's never going to match that because I'm doing enough. So that's pretty constant, I think, but there is 
this element of when you get closer to those big goals, the pressure almost builds because it's this kind of now or never or like you actually could do it now. So there's not the, oh, well, I was never good enough to kind of then ease the pressure back. Um, And I think having experienced disordered eating, I know how like incompatible it is with what I'm trying to achieve. So I can always bring myself back to that when, like you say, it never it never completely leaves you. And if you have those kind of thoughts, it's reminding yourself of that. Um, and I'm so lucky to have such a good support system that I think, you know, it's been a long time since I've struggled with those things. But if that did come up, I'm so confident that I'd be able to, you know, figure it out and and be able to come out the other side of it. But yeah, I think it's really difficult for people who are, you know, still in that place because it, especially with running and, you know, weight being very associated with you know your performance that it can become very intertwined and before you know it they're almost the same thing which I think is is when it gets really difficult because it is challenging on one side like you said you're having to kind of cut weight but at the same time your nutrition is so substantial Mm. and and pivotal to your performance and I guess it is things like having to sometimes weigh the food to the exact gram Mm. you know in order to prepare for certain races so I think so many people listening to that will really benefit from that because there are going to be a lot of people that will come into that sport. And, you know, maybe it's a conversation that needs to be a bit broader, actually, mm. because I de- there are definitely methods in which I think you can get through it mm. where it doesn't yeah. have to be that added pressure. I think as well, like you say, talking about it and bringing other people in, even when that feels really, really uncomfortable and you want to just keep it to yourself, you can then hear yourself talking out loud. And if something sounds a bit, disordered or you know out of touch with reality that can always start the healing process um and also you know something that you keep to yourself is only going to like build and build and if you take a step back and look at where that gets you versus where your goals are and getting to those yeah the contrast can be quite stark if you look at the journey now of where you were and the journey of where you are going to be the big ambition that you've discussed is the road to the Olympics. Mm-hmm. Now, if you look at, I guess, Berlin laying that foundation, what does that path look like for you getting there and stepping foot on that start line and representing Great Britain? To run what I did in Berlin just at the start of the four-year cycle is, is huge. Um, we don't know what the performance requirement is going to be in LA because it's a while away, but those qualifying times are coming down and coming down. Um, to make where it do you Olympics. need to be roughly? Sorry to interrupt you, but where do you think you need to be realistically in order to compete for that spot? So next year's World Championships in Tokyo, the qualifying time is 2.23.30, which is two minutes and three minutes and 20 seconds faster than the Olympic time for this year, in a year. So if you go off that, it could be another nine minutes, which is crazy to think. Um, also, you've got the world ranking system and qualifying through points as well. Um, but marathon running in the UK is really solid at the moment and there's a lot of girls that are running really fast so I think it's going to take getting pretty close to to 220 to go to LA one word is... though Arizona baby that was two words <laughs> Arizona that's the place I just I feel there's, there's something about that move if it takes place I think you'll look back in years from now and go that was that was that's what what changed everything yeah I just feel like you being exposed there it just It's a scary thing to subject yourself to, but ultimately I think you have to connect with, and this isn't to discredit Great Britain because we have phenomenal athletes who do Mm. exceptionally well in this environment, but just try something different. Yeah, I mean, the kind of top performer of the year, Callie, who who ran a good few minutes faster than me in Berlin, is based in Flagstaff, Arizona as well. (laughs) So it's like, it's just this hub of, of runners and you feed off each other over there and it's um it's just that environment you know you know for me it's 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 so special to have these sorts of conversations and when you can hear somebody like yourself's dream and know that it's potentially four years away and i mean if you do qualify for the olympics to do that in america i mean as far as locations go i don't think you could ask for a better place to be but it's it will, around the corner as well like la you know <laughs> you know four, four years sounds like a long time but it really isn't it, yeah. it flies by especially when the pressure is added to you of having to reduce that time you know mm. 
two minutes a minute doesn't sound a lot to certain individuals, but it it is. Yeah. You know, but you have the right mentality for it. And just as a person as well, you know, you are such a likable individual. And actually just to see you achieve that dream, I think will make so many people happy, including myself. And I just I wish you all the best. I hope you can remain injury free for the entire period of time and just to be able to see you on that screen four years from now like you know i'm i i probably will shed a tear as i'm sure many will because it's just it's an amazing thing to see you accomplish it's gonna be cool i'm i'm looking forward to like you said regardless like it's about bringing people along for that journey and putting those scary goals out there and if if we make it great and if we don't we're gonna have a great time in the process and look at the next one sort of thing to wrap things up, there are going to be a lot of people listening right now who may have their own dreams. What advice could you give them when you reflect on what you've achieved? I think it's knowing that your dreams are your dreams. And if other people aren't on board with them, then screw them. <laughs> like just, just go for it. And it, it might be that yours are a little bit weird, a little bit wacky. If it's what genuinely makes you feel good and you want to get there, then do it. Like, enjoy yourself on the way. Philly, you're the dream. I'm so happy I've met you. And thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I genuinely, I've absolutely loved this. And like I said, I just wish you all the best. Thank you so much. Can, we, just give, can, we, give, can we give Philly a little clap here? <laughs> you got to drop that camera, bro, me. Let's give her a little <laughs> clap here. Thank you so much. Best of luck. Thanks. Well done, Bob. Thank you. That was awesome. If you enjoyed today's podcast, you fatty biscuit, all I ask of you in return is that you push that subscribe button and leave a review. Unless it's a bad one, you can keep that your sausage. Your support, though, makes such a difference to this podcast and enables it to grow and connect with even more people around the world.